I learned the language. As I came back to myself, I glanced at Sola, who had witnessed this encounter, and I was surprised to note a strange expression upon her usually expressionless countenance. What her thoughts were I did not know, for as yet I had learned but little of the Martian tongue, enough only to suffice for my daily needs. As I reached the doorway of our building, a strange surprise awaited me. A warrior approached, bearing the arms, ornaments, and full accoutrements of his kind. These presented me with a few unintelligible words, and bearing at once respectful and menacing. Later, Sola, with the aid of several of the other women, remodeled the trappings to fit my lesser proportions. And after they completed the work, I went about garbed in all the panoply of war. From then on, Sola instructed me in the mysteries of the various weapons, and with the Martian young, I spent several hours each day practicing upon the plaza. I was not yet proficient with all the weapons, but my great familiarity with similar earthly weapons made me an unusually apt pupil, and I progressed in a very satisfactory manner. The training of myself and the young Martians was conducted solely by the women, who not only attended to the education of the young in the arts of individual defense and offense, but are also the artisans who produce every manufactured article wrought by the green Martians. They make the powder, the cartridges, the firearms. In fact, everything of value is produced by the females. In time of actual warfare, they form a part of the reserves, and when the necessity arises, fight with even greater intelligence and ferocity than the men. The men are trained in the higher branches of the art of war, in strategy and the maneuvering of large bodies of troops. They make the laws as they are needed, a new law for each emergency. They are unfettered by precedented in the administration of justice. Customs have been handed down by ages of repetition, but the punishment for ignoring a custom is a matter for individual treatment by a jury of the culprit's peers. And I may say that justice seldom misses fire, but seems rather to rule in inverse ratio to the ascendancy of law. In one respect, at least, the Martians are happy people they have no lawyers. I did not see the prisoner again for several days subsequent to our first encounter, and then only to catch a fleeting glimpse of her as she was being conducted to the great audience chamber, where I had had my first meeting with Lord Quaspitamel. I could not but note the unnecessary harshness and brutality with which her guards treated her so different from the almost maternal kindliness which Sola manifested towards me, and the respectful attitude of the few green Martians who took the trouble to notice me at all. I had observed on the two occasions when I had seen her that the prisoner exchanged words with her guards, and this convinced me that they spoke, or at least could make themselves understood, by a common language. With this added incentive, I nearly drove Sola distracted by my importunities to hasten on my education, and within a few more days I had mastered the Martian tongue sufficiently well to enable me to carry on a passable conversation and to fully understand practically all that I heard. At this time, our sleeping quarters were occupied by three or four females and a couple of recently hatched young beside Sola and her youthful ward, myself and Woola the hound. After they had retired for the night, it was customary for the adults to carry on a desultory conversation for a short time before lapsing into sleep. And now that I could understand their language, I was always a keen listener, although I never proffered any remarks myself. On the night following the prisoner's visit to the audience chamber, the conversation finally fell upon this subject, and I was all ears on the instant. 
I had feared to question Sola relative to the, to the beautiful captive, as I could not but recall the strange expression I had noted upon her face after my first encounter with the prisoner. That it denoted jealousy I could not say, and yet, judging all things by mundane standards, as I still did, I felt safer to affect indifference in the matter until I learned more surely Sola's attitude toward the object of my solicitude. Sarkoja, one of the older women who shared our domicile, had been present at the audience as one of the captive's guards, and it was toward her the question turned. When, asked one of the woman, women, will we enjoy the death throes of the Red One? Or does Lorquas Potmel Jed intend holding her for ransom? They have decided to carry her with us back to Thark and exhibit her last agonies at the great games before Thal Hyges, replied Sarjoka. What will be the manner of her going out, inquired Sola. She is very small and very beautiful. I had hoped they would hold her for ransom. Sarkoja and the other women grunted angrily at this evidence of weakness on the part of Sola. It is sad, Sola, that you were not born a million years ago, snapped Sarkoja. When all the hollows of the land were filled with water, and the people were as soft as the stuff they sailed upon. In our day, we have progressed to a point where such sentiments mark weakness and atavism. It will not be well for you to permit Tars Tarkas to learn that you hold such degenerate sentiments, as I doubt that he would care to entrust such as you with the grave responsibilities of maternity. I see nothing wrong with my expression of interest in this red woman, retorted Sola. She has never harmed us, nor would she, should we have fallen into her hands. It is only the men of her kind who wore upon us, and I have ever thought that their attitude towards us is but a reflection of ours toward them. They live at peace with all their fellows, except when duty calls upon them to make war, while we are at peace with none, forever warring among our own kind as well as upon the red men, and even in our own communities the individuals fight amongst themselves. Oh, it is one continual, awful period of bloodshed from the time we break the shell until we gladly embrace the bosom of the river of mystery, the dark and ancient Is, which carries us to an unknown, but at least no more frightful and terrible existence. Fortunate indeed is he who meets his end in an early death. Say what you please to Tars Tarkas, he can mete out no worse fate to me than a continuation of the horrible existence we are forced to lead in this life. This wild outbreak on the part of Sola so greatly surprised and shocked the other women that after a few words, general reprimand, they all lapsed into silence and were soon asleep. One thing the episode had accomplished was to assure me of Sola's friendliness towards the poor girl, and also to convince me that I had been extremely fortunate in falling into her hands rather than those of some of the other females. I knew that she was fond of me, and now that I had discovered that she hated cruelty and barbarity, I was confident that I could depend upon her to aid me and the girl captive to escape. Provided, of course, that such a thing was within the range of possibilities. I did not even know that there were any better conditions to escape to but I was more than willing to take my chances among people fashioned after my own mold rather than to remain longer among the hideous and bloodthirsty green men of Mars. But where to go and how was as much of a puzzle to me as the age-old search for the spring of eternal life has been to earthly men since the beginning of time. I decided that at the first opportunity I would take Sola into my confidence and openly ask her to aid me, and with this resolution strong upon me I turned among my silks and furs and slept the dreamless and refreshing sleep of Mars. <clears throat> 2.30 
champion and chief. Early the next morning, I was a steer. Considerable freedom was allowed me, as Sola had informed me that so long as I did not attempt to leave the city, I was free to go and come as I pleased. She had warned me, however, against venturing forth unarmed, as this city, like all other deserted metropolises of an ancient Martian civilization, was peopled by the great white apes of my second day's adventure. In advising me that I must not leave the boundaries of the city, Sola had explained that Wula would prevent this anyway should I attempt it, and she warned me most urgently not to arouse his fierce nature by ignoring his warnings should I venture too close to the forbidden territory. His nature was such, she said, that he would bring me back into the city, dead or alive, should I persist in opposing him. Preferably dead, she added. On this morning, I had chosen a new street to explore when suddenly I found myself at the limits of the city. Before me were low hills, pierced by narrow and inviting ravines. I longed to explore the country before me, and like the pioneer stock from which I sprang, to view what the landscape beyond the encircling hills might disclose from the summits which shut out my view. It also occurred to me that this would prove an excellent opportunity to test the qualities of Wula. I was convinced that the brute loved me. I had seen more evidences of affection in him than any other Martian animal, man or beast, and I was sure that gratitude for the acts that had twice saved his life would more than outweigh his loyalty to the duty imposed upon him by cruel and loveless masters. As I approached the boundary line, Wula ran anxiously before me and thrust his body against my legs. His expression was pleading rather than ferocious. Nor did he bear his great tusks or utter his fearful guttural warnings. Denied the friendship and companionship of my kind, I had developed considerable affection for Wula and Sola, for the normal earthly man must have some outlet for his natural affections, and so I decided upon an appeal to a like instinct in this great brute, sure that I would not be disappointed. I had never petted nor fondled him, but now I sat upon the ground and putting my arms around his heavy neck I stroked and coaxed him, talking in my newly acquired Martian tongue as I would have to my hound at home, as I would have talked to any other friend among the lower animals. His response to my manifestation of affection was remarkable to a degree. He stretched his great mouth to its full width, bearing his entire expanse of his upper rows of tusks and wrinkling his snout until his great eyes were almost hidden in the folds of flesh. If you have ever seen a collie smile, you may have some idea of Lula's facial distortion. He threw himself upon his back and fairly wallowed at my feet, jumped up and sprang upon me, rolling me upon the ground by his great weight, and then wriggling and squirming around me like a playful puppy, presenting its back for the petting it craves. I could not resist the ludicrousness of the spectacle, and holding my sides, I rocked back and forth in the first laughter which had passed my lips in many days. The first, in fact, since the morning Powell had left camp, when his horse, long unused, had per precipitately and unexpectedly bucked him off head foremost into a pot of frijoles. My laughter frightened Wula. His antics ceased and he crawled pitifully toward me, poking his hug ugly head far into my lap. And then I remembered what laughter signified on Mars. Torture, suffering, death. Quieting myself, I rubbed the poor fellow's head and back talked to him for a few minutes, and then, in an authoritative tone, commanded him to follow me, and arising, started for the hills. 
There was no further question of authority between us. Wola was my devoted slave from that moment hence, and I his only an undisputed master. My walk to the hills occupied but a few minutes, and I found nothing of particular interest to reward me. Numerous brilliantly colored and strangely formed wild flowers dotted the ravines, and from the summit of the first hill I saw still other hills stretching off toward the north and rising, one range above another, until lost in mountains of quite respectable dimensions. Though I afterward found that only a few peaks on all Mars exceed 4,000 feet in height, the suggestion of magnitude was merely relative. My morning's walk had been large with importance to me, for it had resulted in a perfect understanding with Wula, upon whom Tars Tarkas relied for my safekeeping. I now knew that while theoretically a prisoner, prisoner I was virtually free, and I hastened to regain the city limits before the defection of Wula could be discovered by his erstwhile masters. The adventure decided me never again to leave the limits of my prescribed stamping grounds until I was ready to venture forth for good and all, as it would certainly result in a curtailment of my liberties, as well as the probable death of Wula. Were we to be discovered? On regaining the plaza, I had my third glimpse of the captive girl. She was standing with her guards before the entrance to the audience chamber, and as, as I approached, she gave me one haughty glance and turned her back full upon me. The act was so womanly, so earthly womanly, that though it stung my pride, it also warmed my heart with a feeling of companionship. It was good to know that someone else on Mars beside myself had human instincts of a civilized order, even though the manifestation of them was so painful and mortifying. Had a green Martian woman desired to show dislike or contempt, she would in all likelihood have done it with a sword thrust or a movement of her trigger finger. But as their sentiments are mostly atrophied, it would have required a serious injury to have aroused such passions in them Sola, let me add, was an exception. I never saw her perform a cruel or uncouth act, or fail in uniform kindliness and good nature. She was indeed, as her fellow Martian had said, <clears throat> of her an atavism a dear and precious reversion to a former type of loved and loving ancestor. Mm -hmm. Seeing that the prisoner seemed the center of attraction, I halted to view the proceedings. I had not long to wait, for presently Lorquas Potmel and his retinue of chieftains approached the building, and signing the guards to follow with the prisoner entered the audience chamber. Realizing that I was somewhat favored character, and also convinced that the warriors did not know of my proficiency in their language, as I had pled with Sola to keep this a secret, on the grounds that I did not wish to be forced to talk with the men until I had perfectly mastered the Martian tongue. I chanced an attempt to enter the audience chamber and listen to the proceedings. The council squatted on the steps of the rostrum, while below them stood the prisoner and her two guards. I saw that one of the women was Sarkoja, and thus understood how she had been present at the hearing of the preceding day, the results of which she had reported to the occupants of our dormitory last night. Her attitude toward the captain captive was most harsh and brutal. When she held her, she sunk her rudimentary nails into the poor girl's flesh or twisted her arm in a most painful manner. When it was necessary to move from one spot to another, she either jerked her roughly or pushed her headlong before her. She seemed to be venting upon this poor defenseless creature all the hatred, cruelty, ferocity, and spite of her 900 years 
backed by unguessable ages of fierce and brutal ancestors. The other woman was less cruel because she was entirely indifferent. If the prisoner had been left to her alone, and fortunately she was at night, she would have received no harsh treatment, nor by the same token would she have received any attention at all. As Lorquas Putmel raised his eyes to address the prisoner, they fell on me, and he turned to Tars Tarkas with a word and gesture of impatience. Tars Tarkas made some reply which I could not catch, but which caused Lorquas Putmel to smile, after which they paid no further attention to me. What is your name? asked Lorquas Putmel, addressing the prisoner. Deja Thoris. Daughter of Mors Kajak of Helium. And the nature of your expedition, he continued. It was a purely scientific research party sent out by my father's father, the Jeddak of Helium, to rechart the air currents and to take atmospheric density tests, replied the fair prisoner. In a low, well-modulated voice, we were unprepared for battle, she continued, as we were on a peaceful mission, as our banners and the colors of our craft denoted. The work we were doing was as much in your interest as in ours, for you know full well that were it not for our labors, the fruits of our scientific operations, there would not be enough air or water on Mars to support a single human life. For ages we have maintained the air and water supply at practically the same point without an appreciable loss, and we have done this in the face of brutal and ignorant interference of you green men. Why, oh why, will you not learn to live in amity with your fellows? Must you ever go down the ages to your final extinction but little above the plane of the dumb brutes that serve you? A people without written language, without art, without homes, without love, the victims of eons of horrible community idea, owning everything in common, even to your women and children, has resulted in your owning nothing in common. You hate each other as you hate all else except yourselves. Come back to the ways of our common ancestors. Come back to the light of kindliness and fellowship. The way is open to you. You will find the hands of the red men outstretched to aid you. Together we may do still more to regenerate our dying planet. The granddaughter of the greatest and mightiest of the Red Jeddaks has asked you, will you come? Lorquas Potmel and the warrior sat looking silently and intently at the young woman for several moments after she had ceased speaking. What was passing in their minds, no man may know. But that they were moved, I truly believe. And if one man high among them had been strong enough to rise above custom, that moment would have marked a new and mighty era for Mars. I saw Tars Tarkas rise to speak, and on his face was such an expression as I had never seen upon the countenance of a green Martian warrior. It bespoke an inward and mighty battle with self, with heredity, with age-old custom, and as he opened his mouth to speak, a look almost benightly, of kindliness momentarily lighted up his fierce and terrible countenance. What words of moment were to have fallen from his lips were never spoken, as just then a young warrior, evidently sensing the trend of thought among the older men, leaped down from the steps of the rostrum and striking the frail, frail captive a powerful blow across the face which felled her to the floor, placed his foot upon her prostrate form, and turning outward, the assembled council broke into peals of horrid, mirthless laughter. For an instant, I thought Tars Tarkas would strike him dead, nor did the aspect of Lors Potmel augur any 
too favorably for the brute. With the mood past, their old selves reasserted their ascendancy, and they smiled. It was portentous, however, that they did not laugh aloud, for the brute's act constituted a side-splitting witticism according to the ethics which rule green Martian humor. That I have taken moments to write down a part of what occurred as that blow fell does not signify that I remained inactive for any length of time. I think I must have sensed something of what was coming, for I realize now that I was crouched as for a spring as I saw the blow aimed at her beautiful upturned pleading face and ere the hand descended, I was halfway across the hall. Scarcely had his hideous laugh rang out but once when I was upon him. The brute was 12 feet in height and armed to the teeth, but I believe that I could have accounted for the whole room full in the terrific intensity of my rage. Springing upward, I struck him full in the face as he turned at my warning cry and then, as he drew his short sword, I drew mine and sprang up again upon his breast. Hooking one leg over the butt of his pistol and grasping one of his huge tusks with my left hand, while I delivered blow after blow upon his enormous chest. He could not use his short sword to advantage because I was too close to him, nor could he draw his pistol which he attempted to do in direct opposi opposition to Martian custom, which says that you may not fight a fellow warrior in private combat with any other than the weapon with which you are attacked. In fact, he could do nothing but make a wild and futile attempt to dislodge me. With all his immense bulk, he was little, if any, stronger than I and it was but the matter of a moment or two before he sank, bleeding and lifeless, to the floor. Deja Thoris had raised herself upon one elbow and was watching the battle with wide, staring eyes. When I had regained my feet, I raised her in my arms and bore her to one of the benches at the side of the room. Again, no Martian interfered with me, and tearing a piece of silk from my cape, I endeavored to staunch the flow of blood from her nostrils. I was soon successful, as her injuries amounted to little more than an ordinary nosebleed, and when she could speak, she placed her hand upon my arm, and looking up into my eyes, said, Why did you do it? You who refused me even friendly recognition in the first hour of my peril, and now you risk your life and kill one of your companions for my sake? I cannot understand. What strange manner of man are you, that you consort with the green men, though your form is that of my race, while your color is little darker than that of a white ape? Tell me, are you human, or are you more than human? It is a strange tale, I replied too long to attempt to tell you now, and one which I so much doubt the credibility of myself that I fear to hope that others will believe it. Suffice it for the present that I am your friend, and so far as our captors will permit, your protector and your servant. Then you too are a prisoner? But why then those arms and the regalia of Tharkian chieftain? What is your name? Where your country? Yes, Deja Thoris, I too am a prisoner. My name is John Carter, and I claim Virginia, one of the United States of America, Earth as my home. But why I am permitted to wear arms, I do not know. Nor was I aware that my regalia was that of a chieftain. We were interrupted at this juncture by the approach of one of the warriors bearing arms, accoutrements, and ornaments. And in a flash, one of her questions was answered, and a puzzle cleared up for me. I saw that the body of my dead antagonist had been stripped, 
and I read in the menacing yet respectful attitude of the warrior who had brought me these trophies of the kill, the same demeanor as that evidenced by the other one who had brought me my original equipment. And now for the first time I realized that my blow on the occasion of my first battle in the audience chamber had resulted in the death of my adversary. <clears throat> The reason for the whole attitude displayed toward me was now apparent. I had won my spurs, so to speak, and in the crude justice, which always marks Martian dealings, and which among other things has caused me to call her the planet of paradoxes, I was accorded the honors due a conqueror, the trappings and the position of the man I killed. In truth, I was a Martian chieftain and this I learned later was the cause of my great freedom and my toleration in this audience chamber. As I had turned to receive the dead warrior's chattels, I had noticed that Tars Tarkas and several others had pushed forward toward us, and the eyes of the former rested upon me in the most quizzical manner. Finally, he addressed me. You speak the tongue of Barsoom quite readily for one who was deaf and dumb to us a few short days ago. Where did you learn it, John Carter? You yourself are responsible, Tars Tarkas, I replied, in that you furnished me with an instructress of remarkable ability. I have to thank Sola for my learning. She has done well, he answered, but your education in other respects needs considerable polish. Do you know what your unprecedented, unprecedented temerity would have cost you had you failed to kill either of the two chieftains whose medal you now wear? I presume that one whom I had failed to kill would have killed me, I answered, smiling. No, you are wrong. Only in the last extremity of self-defense would a Martian warrior kill a prisoner. We like to save them for other purposes and his face bespoke possibilities that were not pleasant to dwell upon. But one thing can save you now, he continued. Should you, in recognition of your remarkable valor, ferocity, and prowess, be considered by Tal Hojus as worthy of his service, you may be taken into the community and become a full-fledged Tharki. Until we reach the headquarters of Tal Hojus, it is the will of Lorquis Potmel that you be accorded the respect your acts have earned you. You will be treated by us as a Tharkian chieftain, but you must not forget that every chief who ranks you is responsible for your safe delivery to our mighty and most ferocious ruler. I am done. I hear you, Tarstarkis, I answered. As you know, I am not of Barzoom. Your ways are not my ways, and I can only act in the future as I have in the past, in accordance with the dictates of my conscience and guided by the standards of mine own people. If you will leave me alone, I will go in peace, but if not, let the individual Barsoomians with whom I must deal either respect my rights as a stranger among you, or take whatever consequences may befall. Of one thing, let us be sure. Whatever may be your ultimate intentions toward this unfortunate young woman, whoever would offer her injury or insult in the future, you must figure on making a full accounting to me. I understand that you belittle all sentiments of generosity and kindness, but I do not and I can convince your most doughty warrior that these characteristics are not incompatible with an ability to fight. Ordinarily, I am not given to long speeches, nor ever before had I descended to bombast, but I had guessed at the keynote which would strike an answering chord in the breasts of the green Martians, nor was I wrong for my harangue evidently deeply impressed them, and their attitude, attitude toward me thereafter was still further respectful. 
Tars Tarkas himself seemed pleased with my reply, but his only comment was more or less enigmatical. And I think I know Tal Hajis, Jeddak of Thark. I now turned my attention to Dejah Thoris, and assisting her to her feet, I turned with her toward the exit, ignoring her hovering guardian harpies, as well as the inquiring glances of the chieftains. Was I not now a chieftain also? Well then, I would assume the responsibilities of one. They did not molest us, and so Dejah Thoris, Princess of Helium, and John Carter, Gentleman of Virginia, followed by the faithful Hula, passed through utter silence from the audience chamber of Lorquas Putmel, Jed among the Tharks of Barzoom. Mm -hmm.